Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hey everyone, welcome back to the OnScript Podcast. This is Matt Lynch coming to you from Regent College in Vancouver. We have a great episode for you here with Lisa, Dr. Lisa Bowens talking about African-American readings of Paul. And I hope this is a constructive and helpful conversation for you. Uh, as a reminder, if you are able to support the ongoing work of OnScript, we would appreciate your help with that. You can go to onscript.study forward slash donate and just give $5 a month. That would be a huge help to us. Um, also, if you want to give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, you can do that somehow. You go there and you do the rating thing and uh, give your honest feedback. And we'd welcome that, no matter what the outcome. Uh, we've gotten some funny one-star reviews when people listen to the Irvine Shablat. Some episodes don't realize it's an April Fool's episode. Uh, so those, even just for your amusement, you might want to go read some of those. Um, thanks so much to all of you for listening and supporting the show. And let's get on with it. Enjoy. Hello, OnScript listeners. This is Aaron Heim coming to you from Wycliffe Hall at the University of Oxford. And I'm co-hosting today's episode with Drew Johnson of the King's College in New York. Hi, Drew. Hello, Aaron. And I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Lisa Bowens, who is Associate Professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary, to talk about her groundbreaking book, African American Readings of Paul. Lisa, we're so glad you're here. Welcome to OnScript. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, me too. And Lisa, it's clear from the first pages of this book that this uh, topic is tremendously personal for you. So can you just tell us how this book fits into your journey as a New Testament scholar? Wow, great question. Um, well, let me back up and talk about how this project came about, because I think that relates to your question. So I did my dissertation on 2 Corinthians 12, the um, enigmatic passage of Paul going to the third heaven. And one of the things I wanted to do as I worked on that project was to look at how African-Americans interpreted that passage. That was one of the um, areas I wanted to look at when I examined that passage. And my doctor father, in his wisdom, suggested that I look at that as a separate project instead of talking about it just in 2 Corinthians 12. And so long story short, I decided to expand the question from how have African-Americans looked at 2 Corinthians 12 and broaden the question to how have African-Americans interpreted Paul more broadly? And so that question led me to this book because that is a driving question of the book. How have African-Americans throughout the centuries um, interpreted Paul, used Paul in their writings and their autobiographies and their sermons and speeches? And it really was a amazing, an amazing journey for me, because on this journey, I read about interpreters that I had not encountered before. Um, and then on this journey, I also read about interpreters that I had encountered before, but not in, not in relationship to Paul and how they utilized Paul. So this was quite an amazing and inspiring journey for me, um, as I learned about these interpreters and um, how they understood Paul. And maybe for those people who might not know, why why is it an inherently interesting question to think about how African Americans throughout history have actually engaged Paul or or disengaged him as you open the book with? Yes. So yeah, thanks, Drew, for that question. So part of um, one of the reasons why I wanted to initially include African American interpretations on Second Corinthians twelve, my dissertation was because at the time I was writing my dissertation, I was also going to different conferences. And at these conferences, the story of Howard Thurman's grandmother was lifted up. It, it seems like it was a continual theme that Howard Thurman's um, grandmother, Nancy Ambrose, her encounter with Paul, that story was lifted up in a continuous way 
and um, talked about in terms of this is how African Americans approach Paul. And so as I kept hearing that story, which is really a powerful story, as I kept hearing it being told as the way, it opened up a question for me. Is this true? <laughs> and so that was kind of also the impetus of this project, trying to examine how have African Americans encountered Paul? And is that story um, really the paradigmatic story for African Americans? And so I do open the book up with that narrative of Howard Thurman's grandmother, Nancy Ambrose, her encounter with Paul through the slavery text of the master's minister, she says. And um, that story, I think, gives us a glimpse into how some African Americans disengaged Paul, as you said, Drew. But it doesn't tell the entire story. And I think this book kind of, um, I hope it shows that there are a variety of ways in which African Americans have engaged Paul. Some, like Nancy Ambrose, um, found Paul problematic, even though she did gravitate towards 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> um, but then there are so many others who saw in Paul a figure of liberation, a figure for justice, and saw a type of kinship with Paul, if you will, in terms of um, relating to their own suffering context. Lisa, can I just ask how you got interested in Paul? Because I think it would be equally, it, it's equally interesting, um, like, uh, from an African-American perspective. But then as, you know, as a woman, you you also are interested in a, you know, set of texts that is notoriously anti-woman. So um, how did you, how did you come to, to kind of embrace Pauline scholarship and become a Pauline scholar? Was it, you know, because you love Paul or kind of to prove Paul wrong in those instances or... <laughs> I'm just curious. I get asked that a lot too, and I'm I'm just wondering what brought you into the into the Pauline fold. Yes, that's a great question. Um, so I grew up in a tradition, Pentecostal tradition, which really venerates Paul, and so I grew up in a tradition that saw Paul as a positive figure. And so I remember, you know, being in in, in church in Sunday school. I was fascinated by the figure of Paul. Um, I was the kid asking the questions like, who is Paul writing to? And who are these people? <laughs> just really curious about like, who is he writing to? And just those questions, even at an early age, were um, pertinent for me. And it really wasn't until I went to seminary that I realized that there were people who did not appreciate Paul in the way that I did. And it really opened up a world for me that I had not been privy to before. And I began to listen to their stories and how Paul was in some ways weaponized, I think, against um, the people I had communication with and, and how that really caused them to feel a disconnect with the Apostle Paul. So I think having conversations with people who did not appreciate him, like I appreciated him really gave me a new way to think about Paul and to, and to see texts in a different light than the way I had seen them before. And so it didn't um, take away my particular love for Paul, but it did give me a greater sensitivity to um, those people who don't like Paul and it gave me a way to understand why they didn't like him. As you said, many people interpret him as anti-woman and very problematic in so many ways. But in seminary, I took a lot of classes on Paul, which further my love for him. And um, in my dissertation, I talk a lot about the apocalyptic reading of Paul, which is what I gravitated toward in my dissertation and the way I read Paul now. So yeah, I think I get that question often too. <laughs> How can you as a, as a Black woman like Paul? And I think part of it is, as I said, because of my tradition, but also, I think I see myself, I think one of the things that this project generated for me was that my love for Paul is not foreign to the African-American community, right? These interpreters also, African-Americans have a history of interpreting Paul and engaging Paul in positive ways. So it kind of allowed me to see, hey, I'm not an anomaly, <laughs> even though it may seem that way, but there's a tradition there that. Um, that highlights the importance of Paul for African American communities. So, 
I, as I was reading through your book, uh, and I subsequently went and read more uh, I, these defenses of slavery from uh, the biblical literature, because I was I became fascinated. I mean, your book did exactly what a good book does; it strikes up an interest in the topic more generally. And, and I've come to realize that not everybody was cherry, cherry picking, um, but there was some amount of cherry picking, and certainly the slave Bible was just an absolutely cherry picked. Uh, it's the cherry of cherry picking. And so it made me think, uh, okay, is the is the antidote here what we see in many of those early, as you know, the 1774 slave petition, uh, but then all the way up to a 19th century, is the antidote to that cherry picking good biblical theology, or is it uh, is it kind of reversing the energy on those particular passages that are being cherry picked, or something else? If I could ask you to generalize. <laughs> Well, I think so. On one level, you see these interpreters engaging the interpretations of these texts by slaveholders head on, right? Like Frederick Douglass, in talking about the letter of Philemon, which, as we know, was used to justify the Fugitive Slave Act, he takes interpretations of slaveholders of, of that letter head on by saying, You're not interpreting this letter correctly. Because when Paul sends a messenger back, he sends him back as more than a servant, right? As a brother. And Douglas lifts up the part where Paul says, receive him as you would receive me. So you do have interpreters like Douglas who don't hesitate to take on slaveholders' interpretation of scripture and basically say, you're not interpreting this passage correctly because you're not looking at the fine print, if you will. But then you also have people like Lemuel Haynes, who recognizes that slavery exists in the Bible as well. But he goes about it in a way that says, just because slavery existed then doesn't make it right. There, and he, he has a line where he says, in every generation, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but in every generation, you have people who engage in practices that are not correct but it doesn't mean that we need to engage in those same practices. So there are different ways these interpreters go about handling those texts. And I think their voices are important because they show that they were not afraid to take on those problematic passages. And they were doing so in a way to say that scripture is actually for liberation and not for enslavement. Does that get at your question, Drew? Um, yeah. Yeah, and and I I guess I wonder if you found oh this is gonna this is gonna it's a horrible question coming at you right now. Uh, did you find maybe a center to a theological method um, when confronting with these problematic interpretations? Was there a go to move that you would see um, that in any way worked that was effective? Yeah, like a a systematic way that these interpreters go about it. Yeah, I'm hesitant to say that because they all do something different but related, right? They come at the text in different ways, but most of them err on the side of liberation and justice. And I guess if, if you were looking for a center, the phrase of hermeneutic of trust maybe would, they start with the hermeneutic of trust towards scripture. But it's a hermeneutic of trust rooted in their understanding of who God is, right? Who God is, God's character. And so I think for them, this trust towards scripture is very much related to their understanding of who God is. God is liberator. God is a God of justice. So I think if we were to talk about centers um, or a method, um, I think it's more of maybe an understanding of who they believe God to be and their understanding of scripture as God's word. And also I, I should add too that for a number of these interpreters, divine experiences play a huge role in how they interpret scripture. And when you look at how they talk about these divine encounters, when they experience God, These encounters are so profound and so transformative for them 
and also so empowering. They empower them to go forth. I think about like the Black women in the book that I talk about, like Jarena Lee and Julia Foote. These encounters empower them to go forth and um, face any opposition they may face, whether it's because of their gender or because of their race. Um, these, I, I think you can't overestimate how important these um, encounters are for these interpreters. That's very helpful. It's so true in biblical scholarship these days as well. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I retract that statement. Oh, I'm struggling to come up with a question. <laughs> to that I feel like I could go a long way down that line, but I just, yeah. um, I wonder if Lisa, you could talk, I mean, you've talked about um, divine encounters. You talked about a, hum- a hermeneutic of trust, but I mean, I think it's important for us to just impress upon our, our listeners that this is a, a massive undertaking of reception history. You're covering, you know, in, in a, quite a bit of detail, 300 years of reception history of these texts, um, or a little more than that, maybe. What other common threads did you see running through as you, um, as you read these, these authors and their encounter with Paul's literature that you think um, people should know about because it changed how we encountered Paul? Yeah, so <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned about the, the coverage. Initially, when I started this project, I, my goal was to go all the way through the 21st century. <laughs> That was a naive, <laughs> I was very naive. And even with the interpreters that I have covered, I ended up leaving out a lot of people um, that I hope to go back at some point and write about. But there are so many interpreters and so um, many writings that have yet to be mined, I think, for um, African-American engagement of Paul. Some other things to get to your question. So we've talked about the hermeneutic of trust and the understanding of God as a God of liberation and justice. I think also a theme that you see throughout the book is this kinship with Paul um, and suffering that I kind of mentioned a, a little bit ago. But I think some of these interpreters gravitated toward Paul because they saw in him a figure who could relate to their suffering context. And so when he talks about, um, you know, bearing the marks of Jesus on my body, these interpreters understood that. And, and for them, they, his voice became their voice, right? That they too were bearing in their bodies the marks of Christ. You see this in King when he writes about the civil rights movement and how their own physical bodies bear the marks of that struggle. And in relation to that, when Paul talks about in Romans 12, we present our bodies as living sacrifices. King picks up on that as well in thinking and in talking about what the civil rights workers are doing as they are laying their lives and their bodies on the line um, for in nonviolent struggle and bearing again in their, in their bodies the marks. So I think the theme of suffering comes up quite a bit when you read these interpreters and how they relate to Paul. Also, this understanding of sin as a um, cosmic power, which in you know Pauline studies has become known as apocalyptic understandings, right, of, of Paul. And I think you see, even in these interpreters early on, this understanding of sin is not just a personal reality, but a cosmic one and a power that infiltrates systems and structures. And so on the flip side of that, they have that understanding of sin, but on the flip side of that, salvation for them is also cosmic, right? So salvation is holistic. It is affecting, yes, their bodies, but also they believe salvation should affect communities and the nation. And so I think you also see this um, understanding of sin as cosmic, but also salvation as cosmic as well. And do you see some of those same um, trends of thinking continuing in 21st century Black thinkers, um, Black biblical scholarship? Can you give some examples of, of where you see that? Or do you, do you think people are perhaps going different directions? I think we're going in different directions. 
Um, I haven't done a lot of work on 21st century African-American interpreters of Paul. But I would say I do see some interpreters I would lift up, not in terms of the apocalyptic nature of Paul, but the sense of um, what Paul says in Romans 13, Issa McCulley's book, Reading While Black, lifting up this interpretation of Paul as significant for understanding policing, where he talks about policing in um, relationship to Romans 13. So I think you do have African-American interpreters who are taking up Paul in ways that resonate with what's happening in our contemporary context. I would also lift up Dennis Edwards' book, Mike from the Margins. He has a chapter on there about anger and Paul and Silas and how um, anger and rage on the part of Paul and Silas and Acts, how that can be a useful tool when used in um, protesting. So I think you have some African-American biblical interpreters who are taking up Paul, maybe not necessarily leaning in the apocalyptic stream, but they are, in, I think, in a vein similar to these interpreters in the book, um, taking up Paul and applying Paul's voice to our context as these interpreters were applying Paul to their their context. Does that get to your question, Erin? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, okay. clearly you are an apocalyptic thinker, <laughs> Paul. <laughs> um, I've really appreciated yeah, your first right. book. Um, it's oh, taught me a lot you. about how to think about Second Corinthians. So, <laughs> Thank you. I guess I didn't include myself, huh? <laughs> But I think it's I think it's important to to just highlight what you've said because sometimes the apocalyptic school is you know it's like oh the, well this started with Karl Barth and actually you're tracing this back quite a bit further than than Karl Barth um, this you know this way of reading Paul is not just um, you know born of a 20th century theologian like we we see it earlier uh, and I think that's I think that's important to highlight. Yeah, thanks, Erin. And so what I hope is that um, these interpreters, their voices will become integrated into Pauline studies and that that will create a larger conversation, right, with with Bart, with Boltman, with Kazaman and all of these thinkers and enlarge that tent, if you will, to include these interpreters. And I think we'll have even a more rich conversation about um, Paul in, in light of including all of these voices. Yeah, absolutely. I, I hope that happens and that we don't end up with just another little tent. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> that's what happens in Pauline studies. We have, we have, we have African-American tents, right? apocalyptic interpretations of Paul. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, it does present uh, a real problem. And I think it's one of the things uh, when I was reading the book initially, you have this, um, well, personal shame. Wait, I've never heard of any of these people before, or hardly any of these people. And then the question, well, why haven't I heard of any of these people? And uh, and the reality of them being put in conversation with Kazeman or, or Bart is, is partially going to be uh, mitigated by the Credit, the credentialing and the credibility process that these people did not go through for various reasons. Um, so what is, I mean, do you have a, like a strategy? What is the plan? So the book is out, people can read it, they can do more investigation. Uh, it, so to all of those aspiring theologians and, and biblical scholars who listen to this podcast, both of you, both of the listeners, not you, you two, what what would you encourage them to do? Not even with African American, we can think of lots of other readings that need to be mixed into the fold. Um, where do they, where do they go? What they what kinds of things should they be doing? How do they break the same ruts that we all got uh, habituated into us in graduate school? Yeah, I think um, this may sound like a pedantic answer, but I'm going to put it out there. I think being curious goes a long way. And one of the things I hope this book um, spurs is curiosity. Because I have to admit, and I think I said this early on in in our conversation, as I did my research, I have to admit there were people in this book I had never heard of before either, before I started doing the research. And why is that the case? 
that for me, an African American biblical scholar, I have not heard of these some of these people. Um, now, some of them I had heard of, but others I had not. And so I think one of the things, as I said, I hope this book does is to spur curiosity and um, empower people to look in unconventional places for biblical interpretation. Who would have thought that a petition to the government <laughs> would have included a passage from Pauline texts from enslaved people to argue for their freedom? There, I think, I think one of the things is I hope that we will begin to do is to broaden our source texts and to look at primary texts outside of our, that, you know, things that are not necessarily included in the guild, so to speak. And that's one of the things I say in the, in the last chapter of the book about where we can go from here. And I think one of the things is looking at historical documents, looking at um, literature more broadly, looking at um, the incorporation of Paul in music, how was Paul used in music? And I've had that question asked to me a number of times as I've talked about this book. How does Paul relate in terms of the African-American context, the spirituals? So I think for us as a guild to begin to just think about how, how do we broaden our, our source text? How do we broaden where we look at for um, engagement with Paul? And I hope this book kind of spurs that curiosity, that question, because as you rightly say, Drew, there are other interpreters out there that we've yet to uncover, these hidden figures, that should also be a part of the conversation. Hmm. And when you were doing the research for this book, I I honestly, in my mind, pictured Lisa Bowen sitting down with manuscripts and scrolls and you know old codices from the early you know the revolutionary period how how what where were you getting most of your main text were this from a research library that you're working out of yeah so fortunately we have a, a great library here at pts and a great library at princeton university so i was back and forth between these two libraries and fortunately we have anthologies of a number of enslaved um, documents and stories. And so going through those and reading through those um, were very, very helpful for this project. And in terms of like the FBI files, there was an anthology created by a, a scholar named Sherry Dupree of uh, unclassified now FBI files on particular religious leaders of the moment. So going through those files really helped to kind of see what was happening with Mason um, and Seymour and Ida B. Robinson, whom I talk about in the book, how they were under surveillance from the FBI. So it it really was an investigative journey. And I did feel kind of like a Sherlock (laughs) going through and looking for details and uncovering, um, you know, these various figures and what was happening in their time. So it was exciting for me. It was very exciting and illuminating. I learned a lot, quite a lot. Thanks. Um, I think it's time for a speed round. You ready for a speed round? Lisa, you ready for a speed round? The (laughs) only rule is- Here we go, right? (laughs) (laughs) That's right. The only rule is there are no rules, except that you have to answer quickly. Um, and the first thing that comes into your, into your head, you don't have to defend it. We're not going to, we're not going to probe you, uh, for justification for anything you say, but just answer quickly. First thing that comes in. Unless you say something really crazy, we might stop and go off tape and then, okay. (laughs) Okay. All right. Here we go. Lisa, what one food tastes most like home? Sweet potato pie. Uh, and if you hadn't become a biblical scholar, what would you be doing? Librarian. What? Oh, okay. <laughs> you can't ask questions, Drew. That's I know. Sound. <laughs> She's trying to trip me up. She's trolling me, I'm telling you. Uh, uh, do you believe in ghosts? The Holy Ghost, yes. 
<laughs> What's one thing you wish all your students knew? That God is for them. I, I was, if you asked me, I would have said how to properly format a footnote, but <laughs> also <laughs> that God is for them. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> what? And one of you is in the right job. <laughs> uh, uh, what's one memorable or hopefully awkward thing uh, that has happened to you in a classroom situation? Oh man, and I have to be—I have to do this fast. Oh my! Well, if, if um, you don't have like a oh the one time thing, that's that's pretty good. <laughs> or it's not good. <laughs> There's a range well, of things to pick. <laughs> yesterday, when I was talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls, a, a, an 18-year-old lovely young lady said, wait, Dr. Johnson, were you alive in 1947? <laughs> that, was a, that was a showstopper. <laughs> oh. Oh, <goodness. laughs> these kids are so bad at math these days. <laughs> yeah, that's the issue, Drew. <laughs> so what do you got, Lisa? Anything memorable oh, yeah. or awkward or... Well, I think the one thing that comes to my mind, my first year of teaching, I was so stressed out. I kept calling my TA by the wrong name. <laughs> <laughs> and one day, bless his heart, he came up to me after class and he, <laughs> he told me his correct name. I'm Were like, you even I was close? I'm so sorry. As I look back, I think I was. <laughs> <laughs> I made the connection in my mind of why I was calling him this and not his correct name. Oh, yeah. Goodness. But yeah, oh, that's a good he one. was just really, really sweet about it. I was like, I'm just so sorry. I'm so sorry. But yeah, I think that was yeah. one of the weirdest let, things. Let she without sin throw the first stone. Oh, I feel like I should share one now since we've all shared yeah. one. Yeah, my, mine has to be when I was, um, I was a student but I broke my arm when I was like in my final year of seminary and it was my elbow. So my, my hand was like this, oh. um, like held permanently. Like I was raising my hand. So oh. for like two months in my seminary classes, my professors would like continually call on me because they thought that I had something to say. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I can it, was imagine most, those. it was so demoralizing because I never had anything until, and then, and I couldn't, the, at first I couldn't figure out why they were calling on me. So that did not, it just didn't go well. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh no. That's awesome. Okay. Um, what book in biblical studies has been most formative for you as a scholar? Mm, I would have to say Theological Issues in the Letters of Paul by J. Ray Martin. Mm. That was mm. like one of the first books I read in seminary. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think mine, um, his Galatians commentary is definitely up there for me in, yes. in terms of formative influences. Mm -hmm. um, what trend in society scares you? I, I would say a lack of scriptural literacy. And if you were an animal, what would you be? Probably a robin. You heard it here That's first. That's on brand. Yeah. <laughs> it's on brand. <laughs> that, that actually makes sense. You know, some people are like, oh, I'd be a lion. I'm like, really? I don't think you would. Uh, oh, Phil Ziegler but... said he'd be a badger. And now his colleague bought him a, a little stuffed badger in a waistcoat that sits on his desk. So listeners, if you want to get Lisa something, you can send her a little robin for her for her desk now that she that has great. disclosed that she would be a robin. Are, are we done with lightning round for now? Or I, I think so, unless you have more lightning round questions, but that seems very unlightning round. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've only got knock knock jokes, but I'll, I'll spare. Oh, um, so, so Lisa, we... I think one of the things your book does uh, for people who like me, who are just completely unhip to all of these conversations that were going on um, throughout American history up until recently, is it just made us aware that there was this constant intellectual commotion between the African American community and their, their peers, their slaveholders, sometimes their masters and, and their peers and colleagues uh, in the Americas. And the question that burgeoned in my mind throughout was, 
um, so they're, I, I think they're making the more intellectual conversation. They're making the the kind of theological method. Uh, they're they're applying the right kinds of theological methods that I would want to see, for the most part. And I get. I wondered is was it convincing at all? Like, would you consider the enterprise of making these arguments actually convincing to fellow slaves, to uh, former slaves, to slave masters? Or was it all kind of pro forma needs to be in the record, even if it didn't really change anybody's mind? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. So I think on one level, we know that like in terms of the petitions, they weren't granted, right? They were kind of just pushed aside. Um, but I think it's important that we have them as um, documented evidence that even early on, you have scripture being enlisted as um, um, as part of the African American struggle for liberation, and so I think these interpreters were trying, in many ways, to persuade um, the slaveholders, the larger society, to change their minds about how they were viewing these texts and how they were interpreting them. And I do think on on some level that their writings did have an impact on, especially as we move move into the Civil War period, right? So we know like people like Douglas and Harriet Jacobs autobiography, the first African American woman to write an autobiography and to and the fact that she writes it on the cusp of the Civil War, it kind of gave that extra oomph, if you will, for the people in the North to rise up and do something. She says that at the beginning of her autobiography, as well as Maria Child, who endorses the autobiography. We're writing this not because we want to bring attention to, you know, Harriet Jacobs says, I'm writing this not because I want to bring attention to myself, but so that the women in the North We'll see what's happening to their sisters in the South. And then Child says something similar, right? I'm endorsing this autobiography, even though I realize it's, um, it could be uncomfortable to talk about and to read about. But it's important for women in the North to know what's happening to the women in the South. So I do think these writings had an important impact at you know at various stages in American history, but they had an important impact in um, highlighting and foregrounding what was really happening in the South versus what the South was saying was happening in the South. And so you have people like Douglas and Jacobs and Pennington, who also escaped from slavery, and others, you know, I don't include in the book, but you have these testimonies, if you will, of what's taking place. And I think their writings do have an impact on society and on why people got involved in in the Civil War. Yeah. Does that go to your question, Drew? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Lisa, I was really struck by just the sheer number of these powerful and spirit-filled, spirit-anointed women in this book. I, I, I was familiar with a few of their their writings beforehand, but I, like, I, I just I found that so um, encouraging and challenging. Um, and I just wonder if you could pull a few of your favorite moments from their lives and their writings, um, and maybe a favorite a, a favorite figure or two. Um, from the book and from your research? Yeah, so one of my, it's hard to pick favorites, but <laughs> I will say Julia Foote. I, I mean, she is, um, yeah, just like so many of the women in the book, just so phenomenal. And I love the fact that she has a section at the end of her autobiography that she calls A Word to My Christian Sisters. And just kind of like, let's have some girl talk now, right? <laughs> and one of the things she says in that section is, you know, you don't let anyone stop you. Don't let what any man says stop you from doing what God has called you to do. And um, the fact that she 
I mean, she went through so much in her life in following her own call. She experienced excommunication from her church, but she continued to proclaim the gospel. And I think her life is just an amazing testimony, as you say, Erin, to the power of the spirit and um, God's presence at work in her life. The other woman I would lift up is Zilpha, who's also a phenomenal figure in the book, who, like Foot, receives a call to preach the gospel. She travels to the slave states, even though she's born free. She believes God calls her to go to the slave states and preach, and she does. And, and that, to me, is mind-blowing. <laughs> and she talks about her own fears in doing that, even though she knew God had called her and asked her to do it. She follows God in that way. But she also relays you know, her fears about going to the South, knowing that she could be kidnapped and enslaved at any moment. But she does it anyway because she believes that's what God's called her to do. And I love the way she talks about how when she gets there, people are following her, right? Like she becomes kind of this rock star figure. Who is this 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 black woman who is preaching? And um, yeah, she's just phenomenal, as all of these women in the book are. And, and how are these women um, interacting with and encountering Paul in the scriptures and, and in their thinking? How does Paul fit into this equation? I mean, they're phenomenal and amazing in their own right. But then as readers of Paul, there's like a whole other level of just, it's so interesting and fascinating and encouraging, you know, as a, another female Pauline scholar to, to read these women and their encounters with Paul. So can you, can you share how Paul fits in? Yes. Yeah, so for many of these interpreters, they also don't shy away from taking on those passages of Paul that are being used to silence them. As women preachers, they hear these texts thrown at them, right, constantly. You should be silent. And so Zilpha, for example, looks at um, all of Paul's writings to talk about how can you say Paul is saying being silent when he talks about women laboring with him in the gospel? And she lifts up people like Phoebe, and and Junia, and she lifts up all these women and she's saying, there's no way that Paul is asking for women to be silent when you see these women like Priscilla in ministry with him. And so one of the things she says about that particular passage in First Corinthians, she makes the argument that there are things happening in that Corinthian congregation that requires Paul to make that statement. And she makes this ingenious move. She says, "This, these are Paul's words to a church, but not the church, right? That this, what's happening in the Corinthian congregation is some kind of disorder or excess. Those are the terms that she uses. And so Paul makes those statements for that particular church. But as she reasons, it's not for all time and for all congregations. Foot makes a similar move in that she, she's also very attuned to the historical context of Paul, right? That Paul is too, is also um, has women in ministry with him. So she makes a similar move as Elah does in talking about women being in ministry with Paul. And there's no way that these women were in ministry with Paul in silence. And she has this great line about um, when Paul talks about women ministering and laboring with me in the gospel, he means more than they're pouring out tea. That's a great line from Foot. <laughs> and so I think these women, they were very much attuned to Paul's historical context and the understanding of um, women being in ministry, even um, talking about, Foot talks about um, the Greek words that Paul uses to describe male men who are in ministry, the same word he uses to describe women who are in ministry. So there should not be a distinction between between the two. So they are very much in tune with with um, Paul's historical context and making that connection to their own context. Do you think it's fair to say that these women are I mean, uh, are equally shaped, if not maybe more shaped, by Paul's own sense of vocation 
Because when they talk about their vocation, it seems like what I was really struck by is that their imaginations have been so shaped by Paul and his own apostolic vocation that that's what comes out in their calling to preach the gospel. Do you, did I did I understand that correctly? Did I read that correctly? Yes, you're spot on, Erin. And I think, especially you see it, you see it in all of these women interpreters. Um, and Zilpha, I think, points it out even more because she has this this place in her autobiography where she says, like, what Paul's ministry was about is now com- coming about in her ministry. It's kind of like she's continuing the ap- Paul's apostolic mission. It's occurring also in her ministry. So yeah, I think you're spot on that. Their ima- I love the way you put that. Their imaginations are so shaped by Paul's call that it shapes how they see their call as well. And even even when it comes to how they describe their supernatural encounters, Zilpha talks about, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body, using that same language that Paul uses to describe his own encounter. And this understanding that there is a connection with Paul via supernatural experiences, but also in understanding their call in an apostolic way. So they see themselves kind of filling or fulfilling this apostolic role similar to Paul. Yeah, I think you're spot on, Aaron. Yeah. And would it be fair to say, because I love that with the, the, the that part of, I think it was uh, Zilpha Ela, the one where she was saying, this couldn't be what Paul meant if you look across what Paul is saying, that they're so in touch with Paul as as this wider person than anything found in First Timothy or, or uh, elsewhere, that when they hear somebody narrowing down just on one thing, trying to say, no, this is it, uh, they back out to the wider context and say, no, 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 let's, let's think of the whole Paul, not this, this Paul in part, right? Um, that seems to be, if, if I could glean from your book, kind of a, a theological method that, that also let's back out and look at these wider intertextual connections, as we would say today, and let's look at how the Torah features into this and how it comes forward. That's one thing that I, a recurrent theme that I seem to come again and again there. Yeah. And I think um, Abraham Smith, and I talk about him, I think, in the, in the final chapter, he has this um, place where he talks about how the slaveholders were trying to narrow the canon of Paul, which I think goes to what you're saying, Drew. The slaveholders were trying to narrow the canon of Paul, but these interpreters widen the canon. We're not just going to focus on these particular texts that you want us to focus on. Let's look at all of Paul. Let's look at um, the Paul of Acts, which for these interpreters are just as important <laughs> as the Paul of Galatians or First or Second Corinthians. Let's look at all of Paul to see who Paul is um, and get a bigger picture of who he is. Yeah. And there's an intimacy with their their discussion of Paul that I think is really it's 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 refreshing to be honest because I don't think. In current biblical scholarship, you can't speak of the text that intimately, that personally. Like Paul is a person that we might know. <laughs> um, and I, and I was just struck by the, the fact that there's there's like this personal, um, intimate knowledge of Paul that they that they use to say, no, wait a minute, you, we need to look wider. Not because that's better theological method, but because I know God in the Spirit, and I know what Paul says. You know, and it's and that's the justification for it, which um, I suppose is not particularly academic, but it's pretty it's pretty theologically profound. Um, speaking of theological method, I, I I have to ask a method question now, to, <laughs> um, because there's got to be some way to slip this in. But um, but through, throughout the book, you have this this phrase that you use. Uh, you talk about the presence of a body hermeneutic in African American readings of Paul. And it's kind of surprising that we've been talking for as long as we have, and we haven't actually used this term yet. Uh, But I think it's really important. So Lisa, what is a body hermeneutic and why is it important um, for understanding African-American readings or maybe just readings of Paul? Yeah. So one of the things that struck me as I was doing this research is the importance of the body for these interpreters. 
And so two questions I raise in the book, and I think it's uh, appropriate for um, this part of the discussion. Two questions I think they raise is, can Paul interpret my body? And can my body interpret Paul? And these questions are important, I think, especially in light of the historical context, right, where Black bodies were contested sites. You had the slaveholders on one hand saying, your bodies belong to me, and not just your bodies, when you read this text, these slaveholders are also saying your souls, if you have souls, which is a whole other conversation. That was a debate at the time. But we see that in Harriet Jacobs text, right, where she talks about the slave owner telling her like her whole body and her soul belongs to him. And we have that in other texts too. So th- this question of can these interpreters raise, can my black body interpret Paul is an important question. And can Paul interpret my black body? That's an important question because these bodies were in this time devalued, dehumanized, um, considered so insignificant. And when they are reading these texts, these texts are also reading them and bringing their bodies, if you will, into existence in a way that counteracts what society is telling them their bodies are. And this is to go back to our earlier conversation about the importance of these supernatural experiences. That relates to this body hermeneutic because these supernatural experiences affect their bodies. Their bodies are transformed and touched by the divine, showing that their bodies matter. Their bodies are significant to God. And they are valued by God. And this is so important. I keep saying so important because it is. Because when you look at John Jay's account, another person I talk about in the book, he talks about how the slaveholders were constantly telling them, you have no God. You have no God. And so when he has his own divine encounter with God and um, converts to Christianity, this understanding of his body changes, right? His body is significant. His body is value. His body, his body is important. And his body is given agency. These African-American interpreters' bodies are given agency through the experiences they have with God. And this part of this agency is the ability to interpret the text um, apart from the slaveholders' interpretation. So these experiences empower their bodies and grants them agency. They go forth, they preach, they teach, they interpret scripture. And so in many ways, they are answering that question, right? That Paul is interpreting their bodies as having value and their bodies are likewise interpreting Paul or showing that their bodies do have value. Can I just ask a follow-up question? (laughs) Um, That was, I mean, that was, that was an amazingly profound answer. So I, I I hesitate to even ask a follow-up question, but um, as I was thinking about um, body hermeneutic, I mean, you've, you quite intentionally placed this as a, um, or pitched your book as a, as a, um, you know, a a work of reception history, but it made me think um, over and over throughout the book, does this body hermeneutic have something to say to this, you know, the dominant strain of historical um, criticism that has ruled the day in biblical studies, which is decidedly disembodied and supposed to be disembodied. And so it just, it made me, it made me reflect on, on, you know, why is this reception history and historical criticism, this disembodied thing is real biblical studies. Um, might, might this body hermeneutic have something to teach us? Um, I just love, 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 love your thoughts on that. If you've, um, if you've given it thought, and how we might begin to be more embodied as historical <laughs> interpreters. Well, I don't know if I can answer how that last part. 
Uh. But I do think <laughs> your question, Aaron, is making me think about it's something that we talk about in Pauline studies in some circles, but we don't maybe we don't talk about it enough or highlight it enough. So Paul was big on experience. And I think these interpreters pick up on that. I mean, Acts is Damascus Road experience. But in Galatians, if we want to, okay, well, that's Acts. If we want to go to Galatians, he says, Christ was revealed in me or to me, however you take that preposition. He's huge on experience. He talks about his own revelation of Christ. And in Galatians 3, he reminds the Galatians of their own experience with the Spirit. So I think there are places in Paul, I think to get to your question, where maybe we have not really talked about what's there. It's there. (laughs) But for some reason, we've kind of not talked about it. And maybe it is because we feel like well, if we include the, the experience is not really, you're not really doing real historical work if you talk about experience. And maybe, maybe there's some aversion to that. But I think these interpreters pick up on the importance of experience for Paul and the emphasis that he places on that for his own understanding of who he is. They pick up on that and understand how experience plays a huge role in their understanding of who they are and who God is calling them to be. So whether or not we get back to or recapture experience, I think these interpreters could be good conversation partners for such a project. And I know my colleague here, Dale Allison, is just... um, releasing a book on religious experience. So he's, I think, one of the people in the field who is very much attuned to the importance of religious experience. But it's definitely something that, as biblical scholars, especially Pauline scholars, I think we do need to take into account more. I hope that gets to your question in some way. Oh, yeah, absolutely it does. And it just just reminds me of how much I have to do in terms of my own self-reflection on embodiment and how it intersects with historical criticism, you know, critical scholarship. And um, yeah, just, just lots to think about, I think. Um, Lisa, I I think we have time just for one more question, unless Drew wants to jump in with more questions. No, because I would drag us another hour long. so. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So just to wrap up, Lisa, what's your hope for this book? Well, I hope this book begins, or maybe I should say continues, a conversation in Pauline studies. And I hope it helps us as Pauline scholars to include voices in the discussions of Paul that have not been included before. And I also hope that this book helps us see the importance of scripture in our own contemporary context as it's as a source and a resource for justice and liberation. Like we have a whole history of scripture, yes, being used in really awful ways, but also we have, I think, a more powerful history of scripture being used in ways that are life-giving and life-promoting and justice-oriented ways. And I hope that this book helps us to see that that's also a part of our DNA as as Christians, as believers, this understanding of God as liberator, a God of justice. So I hope this book kind of spurs that um, those conversations about the importance of scripture for justice work. Yeah, I hope people will begin to investigate these hidden figures that I talk about in the book a little bit more. And, include them in the conversation. 
Thanks, Lisa. Well, on script listeners, that's all we have time for today. We've been speaking with Dr. Lisa Bowens about her book, African American Readings of Paul. Um, Lisa, thank you again for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure. And thank you, on script listeners. We'll see you next time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just two or five dollars per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study/donate.